Fantastic, guys. Wonderful. Thanks for having me, TJ. Awesome, man. Awesome stuff. You know, your name sounds a little bit of a French. Is it uh, Armand? <laughs> Is it Armand? Is it Armand? I normally say to my wife, when she needs to be a bit romantic, she needs to call me Armand. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, a top of a, it's a French name, but <laughs> yeah, no, man. I'm just, just a joke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Welcome, um, Armand. Um, and Armand, you, you are a property attorney, and um, let, let's just jump into it. And who's Armand? Eh? Okay, so Armand, yeah. So basically, um, I'm part of a company called Dykes and Nell Incorporated. Right. We specialize in property law, obviously, mainly conveyancing. Right. and commercial work when it comes to um, developments and those type of things. And yeah, um, I've always wanted to become a lawyer and study law, but then soon realized there's different fields that you can specialize in. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, just after school to start working at a law practice that specialized in conveyancing. And yeah. that's where my love started for property. And, and why, why property law? I mean, like you just mentioned now, you, you could have chosen others by default, you started working for a, for, a, for a company that was doing a lot of conveyancing. But I mean, you could have chosen criminal law. You could have chosen all these other laws that are there. But why did you stick with property for up until now? I think the experience that I built up, because um, I wasn't fortunate enough to go and study full-time. So yeah. I basically had to work full-time and study part-time. So I studied through NISA, worked full-time, and obviously paid my own studies. And then I think all the experience and everything that I built up working for conveyancing practice made me feel important because I was this youngster and I was learning all these things. And then I soon realized and saw, yes, there's a lot of people making money. They're buying property, selling property, investors, developers. And I always make the joke by saying, if you're a litigation attorney, sometimes you end up suing your own clients for your money. But in property law, they need to pay the bond attorney and the transferring attorney before lodgement takes place in the deeds office. So you're guaranteed of receiving your fees. hundred <laughs> percent. So you only focus on conveyancing nothing else. And that's what you focus around property. That's it. Only conveyancing. Yeah. Okay. With that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to be talking about, you got it right. Yes. Conveyancing. And, um, well, um, from from your guys' company, you are nationwide, isn't you? Your your footprint is quite it's quite big. Yeah, the Dykes name is quite big. You've got Dykes van Eden in Cape Town, Belleville. You've got um, Dykes van Eden in KZN, and obviously um, we Dykes and now here in Gauteng. Hundred percent, good. And um, I should say that uh, I've been hanging out with with Armand for, for the last year plus or so, you've been managing some of uh, our transaction coming through into your offices, the complex ones, the easy ones, and, <laughs> and the ones that we are not so sure what is happening, uh, but you have managed to you know, navigate to, through the process. And today we just wanted actually to talk about the process of convincing because a lot of people for the first time, I could be a first time an investor, I could be a first time home buyer. We are actually not um, a fair that there is this process. I've seen people going to buy uh, a piece of land or buying a property and they're exchanging cash in that transaction and boom, the person is gone and they go to the police station and say, uh, I bought this piece of land, but now, uh, my money is gone. 
what is the role of conveyance or what is conveyancing? Basically, um, TJ, that's to safeguard all the parties involved. And in a conveyancing process, you get three types of attorneys. Right. You get your transferring attorney. That's the attorney that will transfer the property from the current owner, being the seller, to the new purchaser. You get your bond attorney. The bond attorney will register the bond in favor of the purchaser by the bank, with the banks. And then you get your bond cancellation attorney. So if there's existing bond over the property that needs to be canceled in favor of the seller, then you get obviously a bond cancellation attorney doing that. So there's normally up to three attorneys involved in a property transaction. But it can happen that there's only one attorney because a person might buy cash, so you don't need the bond attorney. Or a person can obviously do not have a bond over the property and then there's no need for cancellation. But normally you get the three attorneys involved, yeah. In a transaction, and, and I'm glad that you have actually just split them for us there. Um, and I want to zoom into the guy where the property is cash, uh, so which then means that you just need a conveyancer in there. Um, and in your view, can when we are buying a property like that one, um, and it's, it's cash, there is no bond on it, um, what is the baby steps of actually getting a, pros, um, a property over to the finishing line to the next person? So I see this property, I put in an offer to purchase, when do you get involved? It's a cash deal. So normally the transferring attorney will receive the offer to purchase. Right. And the guys must remember out there, it's the seller's prerogative to nominate the transferring attorney. Some buyers would say, but we are paying the fees. Why should the seller nominate the transferring attorney? It's always, well, we always... always my argument. That is always my argument. <laughs> I should say I don't like that. I'm, I'm, I'm the guy with the money here. <laughs> You see, it's the, it's the, we normally say it's the seller's um, most valuable asset and he's obviously making money or not making money, whatever the case might be, but, might be, but normally, obviously, they make money, they make proceeds and they've got a good relationship because they buy, because they sell, because they've maybe used the attorney before when they bought. Now they want to obviously use their attorney, hence the reason why um, the seller nominates a transferring attorney. It's just a, a common um, rule out there then. 100%. Can I, can, as the buyer, can I motivate, can I swingle someone for me to actually choose my own transferring attempt? Of course you can, TJ. So in the offer to purchase, you can say if there's a, a, state, agent, a state agent involved or if it's a private sale, you can say, I'm making it one of the conditions in the offer to purchase that, wa that I want to use my attorney. And normally the seller would say, but why do you want to use your attorney? Are you guys going to delay the transfer? What is, what is your reason behind you want to choose your own attorney? So obviously the buyer can say, I'm getting a, do a good discount on the transfer fees because um, I know these attorneys. I've been buying and selling a lot of properties through these attorneys. These attorneys are handling my trust or everything for me. So I would prefer going with this attorney at the end of the day. But you can surely definitely motivate that the purchaser can use his attorney. If you make it a condition of the offer, it's the seller's choice. And nine out of the 10 times, the seller will go for it. Okay. So that's the role of the transferring attorney there, right? And um, we, we, we're going to speak to the other two attorneys that we did speak about, but I want to zoom in into the transferring attorney. So now we've got this property, right? They see the offer to purchase. What, what's, what's the next step? Because I'm sitting here, I'm the buyer, and you are my transferring attorney. You're kind of like working in the background there. I don't even know what is happening. Um, what, what are the steps that, that go into that? DJ, basically for today's conversation, I would say let's break it down in six steps, basically. Right. So first of all, we can say step one will be the bond cancellation figure. So right. the bond cancellation attorney will request the, the, the original title deed and the bond cancellation figure from the existing bondholder, which will be the bank. Right. Okay. So that's basically step one. Then if we go over to step two, it will be the rights clearance figure. So right. once, the, once the property transaction is safe and secure, the purchaser has paid the cash, 
or there's a bond that's been granted, the transferring attorneys will apply to the council for rights clearance figures. Now, what is rights clearance figures, DJ? It's basically the rights, the taxes, the water, the electricity that's billed to the account. And you need to pay that in advance for up to three to four months, and then you will get your rights clearance certificate. Now, before you can lodge in a deeds office, you need your rights clearance certificate to enable you to lodge. That's one of the most important certificates that you do need. Right. Now that you... Okay, then... Yeah, go ahead. Then, basically, if you go on to point three, the guarantees... So again, when the, bond is, um, when the bond is secured and everything is in place, the transferring attorney will contact the bond attorney and ask for guarantees. Now, what is the guarantees? That's basically letters from the bank confirming that on registration, the um, bank will pay out the guarantees. Now, you normally get two types of guarantees. One guarantee to cancel the seller's existing bond, yeah. That amount that he owes to the bank. And secondly, the one for the proceeds, the one that we want to hear, the moolah that the seller is making in his pocket after he's selling the property. Yeah. So that is basically the guarantees. Then point four, we can talk about um, the transfer documentation and the costs. So the attorneys will contact the, bu the buyer and the seller to sign the transfer documentation. So the purchaser and the seller will go to the transferring attorney's office, but obviously in our case, being Dykes and now we will travel out to the client, wherever the client's based, and we will sign up the client either at his office or at his home. And we, that obviously expedites the matter. That's what we've learned from fast experience that expedites the matter. You don't have to take off work and go to the attorney's office. We find you when the documentation is ready and we go out to yourselves, being the buyer or the seller, and we sign you up. So then the bond, the bond um, attorneys will also contact the purchaser to sign their documentation. Now, again, this is what we spoke about earlier. Then the purchaser will have to pay the bond fees to the bond attorneys, the transfer fees to the transferring attorney, and then transfer duty. Transfer duty is obviously government cost that you need to pay to the um, South African Revenue Service. And transfer duty is exempt up to a million rand. So if you're buying a property from whatever amount up to a million, you don't pay transfer duty. And over and above a million rand, it goes on a sliding scale and you pay transfer duty. Then that amount needs to be paid and that transfer duty will be paid by the transferring attorney to SARS. And SARS will issue you then with a transfer duty receipt. And that's the two most important documents, the rights claim certificate and the transfer duty receipt that you need to enable you to lodge in the deeds office. Now, obviously, DJ, that was point four. Going to point five is lodgement. Yeah. Now, that is what all the state agents and the sellers want to hear. Because as soon as it comes to lodgement, it means things are almost there. You're almost going to get your money, either your commission or your proceeds. 100%. So, the bond attorneys and the bond cancellation attorneys will then submit their documents to the bank for approval. And if the banks are happy with those documents, they will give their go ahead in the forms of a proceed saying that you can lodge in the deeds office. Then the three attorneys being the transferring attorney, the bond attorney and the bond cancellation attorney, they will lodge simultaneously in the deeds office. Now, once a transaction has been lodged in the deeds office, it takes approximately seven to 10 working days for registration. Right. We had a bit of hiccups during um, 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 COVID and the lockdown because there was a bottleneck effect at the deeds office and at the council with people, obviously, um, the whole process taking a bit longer than it should. But from my experience currently now, everybody was working very hard at the council, at the deeds offices. There's no more bottleneck currently. Everything is going smoothly. I, al I almost want to say that it's almost back to normal. So this is our experience that, that, that obviously we see currently going on. And then the last point for our discussion today, TJ, is registration. So upon registration, the purchaser becomes the new owner of the property and the seller is no longer the owner. And then the banks will pay out the guarantees, the commission, and to settle the existing bond for the um, seller. And the deal is registered. Happy days for everyone. Awesome stuff. It sounds so easy 
Armand, that <laughs> almost sounds like, you know, you're buying a house and next week you're going to be in that house. But, um, you know, being a property investor myself, I have seen crazy stuff. I have seen timelines just going out. Um, in, your, in your view, and maybe I, might, I should ask this question differently to say, in the process that you've given us, the six step process, right? And I like the way that you've put it, put it across. Can the transfer attorney, bond cancellation attorney, um, and the other third one? Um, bond attorney. Bond attorney. Can it be all one person or one yes. firm? Yes, it definitely can. So to enable you to do bonds, you need to be on the bank's panel. And then right. there's a lot of criteria that you need to adhere to to be able to be on a bank's panel. Because if you don't perform, you'll be kicked off the panel. If you do illegal stuff, you'll be kicked off the panel. But to answer your question, yes, most definitely. One attorney can be the bond attorney, the bond cancellation attorney, and the transferring attorney. Okay. For a person like me who's always buying properties, right? Um, it, do I have the right to ask my, the attorney that I'm working with? So I'm asking you, Armand. Okay. Say, um, are you, I know you're a transferring attorney. Great. Okay. Can you do also bond cancellations? Uh, well, because you've done one or two days of mine out, then we might say yes, but I don't know. But can I ask that question even before I even do any work with you? That's a very good um, question, TJ. So the bank has got their specific systems in place where they allocate a certain amount of bonds per month to the bond attorneys. So right. they basically want to share that cake between all the attorneys. So what, what you can do as the buyer, you can say to your private banker or your originator, listen, I would like to use X, Y, and Z to do my bond registration. Right. Then they will ask you, do you know if they're on the bank's panel? Yes, I definitely know that they're on the bank's panel. But then the, it's up to that bank because it's system generated. They will send out this, the, the specific bond instruction to this attorney. And it's also, it's got to do with your specific area. So what they will do is even though we drive out to people all over uh, Gauteng and we've got offices all over the country, they are not some are going to appoint a attorney in, in, in Cape Town if you live in, in Gauteng, for example. Right. So it's also, also system generated, but you can definitely motivate that. And, and we have a lot of clients that has motivated like that. And they, they, they were able to obviously get their bond attorney appointed. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking of this, right? Um, I mean, I'm, I, I do this for a business. It's a business for me. Yes. So definitely 100%, if I'm now working with someone like you, I like your services, um, you know where my office is and all of those things. And yes. our relationship is maturing. I, I wouldn't just want to get any bit pompori somewhere out there who's now helping my staff and it just gets delayed for no reason, right? Yeah. Um, and my thinking is that if I can get a one-stop shop, convenience for me with what I'm doing is I'll pay a good price for convenience because I know the work is being done, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and hence I'm asking that question because I think, I don't think I'm the only guy who's like that. I think a lot of people would be like that. I mean, that's why we all go to Woolies, hey? They peel the nitrous for us. <laughs> And you pay the price, DJ. You pay the price, eh? <laughs> exactly. We don't complain. I, I, I've always been wondering about that, uh, Arman. I see the right. night pulled over. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> Yeah. So it takes the fun out of it, man. But DJ, like I said, um, the transferring attorney can definitely be appointed uh, normally by the seller. The purchaser can motivate or make it a condition. But when it comes to the bond, you can ask for the bond attorney. But like I say, normally the banks will advise. It's system generated. They are going to allocate whoever is on their panel. Awesome stuff. I had a transaction okay. recently where um, the seller was actually UK-based. And I'm just thinking, you go out to people to sign. I think I should have just chosen you guys. Uh, it could have helped us in the process because right now we are waiting for the paperwork. It's stuck somewhere between, what do they call it? Royal Mail, the UK one, 
And here, we don't know where the paperwork is. So that's our biggest challenge right now. In a case like that one, Armanda, how would you work around that solution? Okay. So we've got a lot of um, um, purchases and investors that lives overseas, DJ, or people that's basically immigrated to wherever in the world. And they basically use us for the simple reason that we will send them their documentation via email. Right. And unfortunately, there's certain documents that you will have to sign in front of a commissioner or master of the piece. So they will have to go to the embassy and sign those specific documentation in original form with those people. Right. And then what they will do is they will just send it back to us via a courier service and we will receive it within a day or two. So that should not actually delay the transfer process. We've had some instances where people had to travel very far to a certain embassy to enable them to sign the documentation and to get the necessary stamps on the affidavits. But that normally does not delay the transfer. Mm. I like that. Uh, speaking of transfers, right, um, in, in recent times, I've had, I've had transfers that has been delayed. Um, for instance, I'll give you an example. I had a transaction, and this transaction here, uh, we had paid cash, and the cash had gone through to the transferring attorney. And yes. like it is, the seller had actually chosen the, um, the transferring attorney. I just thought that they were a Mambara person. That's what I just thought because I'd send an email, they wouldn't respond to me. I'll give them a call, they'll come back to me after five days. I'm like, what is happening here? So at first, from where to go, I wasn't even comfortable with them. Eventually, when the property was about to register, they did indicate to us that the property was in lodging. And we were like, yay, let's go in. And somewhere they say, the deeds, the title deed of the property was lost and they now needed to actually go and advertise. And I want us to speak yes. briefly around where I'm buying a property cash, the title deed is lost, it, so it can't take transfer, right? Um, how, what, what does that process look like? So basically, if the seller owes money over the property, the bondholder will be in possession of that title deed. Right. If he doesn't owe any money over the property, he will be in possession of the title deed. And unfortunately, like in your case now, TJ, it does happen that either the seller or even at the, at the deed's office or the, or the attorneys, whoever, even the banks, it does happen that the title deed, for some other reason, gets lost. And you cannot obviously go ahead with that title deed without the title deed. You need the title deed. Now, last year, you were still able to do an application in the deeds office for a lost deed. And that, that by, my basically took between three and four days and you received a copy of the original and everything was fine. But unfortunately, since the end of last year, they came and they said, you're not allowed to do that process anymore. You need to advertise in the government gazette and uh, the local newspaper and all those type of things. So unfortunately, it's delaying the process now before they can give you the original, uh, a copy of the original title deed. I see. They, they, in, in, in our terms, we call it a VA application. Okay. 100%. So we've got now the application, uh, we've got the VA application going and eventually the title deed came through. That's what they said to us. And we were like saying, okay. hey, we're going to go to register now, lodging is about to happen. And then they said, oops, we don't have the COC. We're waiting for the COC. So I objected. And Armanda, I want to ask of you here that was I, was I in my right lane because I objected and I said, hold on, what do you mean we don't have the COC? We were about to lodge a couple of weeks ago, which meant that we should have had the COC. The only issue that we had back then was because the, um, the title deed was not in place. In my view, yes. the COC doesn't expire. Well, I mean, it doesn't expire in a short period of time, but you know, eventually it does expire. I think, uh, how long does it expire? A year, two years? It's valid for two years, yes. Okay. 
So we haven't gone over 12 months. Where is the COC? Could I have access to the COC? It went on, Armand, for a good maybe three months, back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, I started pulling out my sword, my samurai sword. I'm like, you know, things need to happen here. In, in this case, what could we have done differently for us not to even pulling swords on people? You know what I mean? Okay. CJ, just to answer your question, what I want to do is, so if there's a, um, a bond involved, and obviously in your case, it was a cash deal, but let's say if there's a bond involved, the bank, when you submit your documents to the bank to give you your proceeds to enable you to lodge being the bond attorney, if you don't have a valid COC, the bank will not give that permission to the bond attorney or the proceed to lodge. So right. if it was a bond, the attorneys could not have lodged because they wouldn't have had the, um, obviously the proceeds to lodge from the bank. But in a cash situation, there's no um, 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 bank involved. So you could have made a, a deal with, with the attorneys could have spoken to the buy and seller to say, listen, on registration, we are going to keep, let's say, 10, 20,000 rand back just in case if you do not issue the COC. So there's a lot of things that could have been done. So this deal could have registered, obviously, without the COC. We know it's all a legal requirement to have a valid COC. But yep. in this instance, if the buyer and the seller agreed, listen, we need registration to go through. I want to become the buyer. And obviously, the seller said, listen, I need to sell my property now. Let's do something. Let's keep X amount back. And then during that period, while the deal was lodged and we waited for registration, electrician could have been sent out to, uh, to obviously issue a valid a COC. So there is things that could have happened in that instance, DJ. And what I'm always saying, what it boils down to is you need to deal with the right attorneys, people that specialize in conveyancing. Because... As a certain seller will say, this guy helped me with my divorce. Now, obviously, he's a divorce lawyer. He doesn't do conveyancing. He doesn't know how conveyancing works. So you will get that transfer and you'll get somebody in his office to say, it can't be this difficult, just do the deal. Or let's send it to one of my colleagues that does conveyancing. And obviously, maybe that attorney is not going to give the necessary attention to your um, transfer because he's got a lot of other work. He doesn't know you from above. So... So that's why the deal takes long. And that's why he's not going to go out of his way to assist you in this matter or when there's a problem. 100%. In a case where there is incompetence of this nature, what is my recourse as the buyer? Because obviously the attorney here was picked from, I'm talking worst case scenario here. This has been my worst deal ever, right? Um, and this is, by the way, a very true story that happened. Um, and... What's my recourse? What can I do? What steps can I do? I eventually actually pulled out of that deal. We've, we found some clauses in the um, offer to purchase and we put them onto terms from there we pulled out. But I lost out. I lost out in time. I lost out on that deal. I lost out in emotionally, you know, psychologically, I was hurt, you know. Uh, I told my wife that this deal is available and all of a sudden it's no longer available. My wife's looking at me like, what are you doing? You working every day, you're playing. You know what I mean? So what, what recourse? Do I have any? Exactly. So you see, the attorneys will say in terms of the COC, the seller normally needs to provide the COC. Yeah. So they would tell you, TJ, you must place the sell on terms, which you guys have done. So if you, in terms of the offer, you normally place the um, sell on terms, give him seven days to rectify his breach. Right. So obviously if he doesn't rectify his breach within seven days, the deal is canceled and it's obviously becomes null and void. But in this instance, you are saying you feel that the attorneys didn't do what they supposed to do. They, they didn't take the necessary steps. Again, the, 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 the people that obviously governs attorneys uh, is, um, used to be the Law Society. It's now called the Legal, Legal Practice Council, the LPC. Okay. You can always lodge a complaint, a complaint with the Legal Practice Council advising them, this is the circumstances, this is what happened, this is the entire situation. You think they, as the governing body of these attorneys, 
should basically look into um, their services and see if they're doing uh, what they should be doing. So you can also um, obviously lodge a complaint with the Legal Practice Council. Okay, so there is a big brother there. And again, you know, these are the things that, yeah, these are the things that we don't know as consumers. And we go in this year and I mean, I was literally taken in for a ride. Imagine someone out there who's buying their first house is going through the same process. And yeah. I, I was tailored for maybe about eight to nine months, right? Um, sure. and, and this thing could have gone on for longer. Yes, COVID was here, but again, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I want and to- And sorry, just to, just to add on that, you paid cash for the transfer. Yeah. So that money was sitting in a trust account Right. And normally, if you earn, uh, the, the, that attorney must obviously um, invest your cash into an interest earning account, interest bearing account. And normally, the interest that you earn with the attorneys and the interest that you earn with your own bank is two different things. It's, it's a lot less. And you basically lost out on a lot of interest there as well, um, um, DJ. 100%, which is why I'm saying, you know, my wife gave me a little bit of clips there because she's saying that I, you know, we have lost out, you know, you, I'm saying yeah. work to be doing something good and this is what you're doing. So, you know, so, so from that perspective alone, you know, being on a serious note, that, that yeah. attorney to me, I felt like they were incompetent, number one, they didn't even care about custom service. And I was shocked that there's still people who run small businesses. Um, because I mean, if you're an attorney and you got, it's your own brand and your own name on it. Yes. Surely you should be just trying to do some things on an extra mile, but this didn't happen. But this is kind of like my worst case scenario. Are there yeah. are any other Armand worst case scenarios that you can make us aware and what is it that we can do to be aware of it and rectify it. You see more okay. transactions than I do. Yeah, yeah. PJ, something that happens quite often in our office and other offices as well, a person will go to the bank and apply for a bond right. and they will ask the specific purchaser, how are you married? And he would say, I'm married out of community of property. Right. So, Ends the reason it's only necessary for me to sign. Right. And then when we get all the certain documentation and we do all the necessary checks, we will find out that even though this person thought that he or she was married out of community ah, property, ah, that specific, right. that specific right. document was never <laughs> registered. And you would say, listen, who do you think you are? Um, I've got a contract here, but then I'll say, dear sir, was that contract registered at the deeds office by your attorney? And you would say it should have been, but then it's never registered. Now, if that contract is never registered at the deeds office, the marriage certificate, the marriage, then obviously you are married in community. And now you need your wife to sign. So now the whole bond process needs to change because it's not only one buyer, but now it's husband and wife. And maybe in this case, the either the wife or the husband's got a, a, a bad credit record or judgment, and then that bond can't go through. And remember, this can be found out l later during the transfer process. So it's the reason the attorneys that you deal with needs to do those checks quite soon, sooner than later to establish, is this guy really married out of the community? Please give me your marriage certificate. Please give me your, um, your contract, your anti-national contract, so that we can see that you um, are married out of community of property. So that happens quite often where people think they married out of community, but they married in, in community of property. The reason why I was laughing there, Armand, is because you said people think that they are, think, right? I mean, you're married, so you shouldn't be thinking, you should be knowing, right? Um, exactly. But I mean, if this is this is a common problem, wh what could be the root cause of that? People not just being negligent in their documentation, or is it the other lawyers, marriage lawyers that we we trust? You see, normally what happens is you get your pastor or your duomini, whoever, and he'll say, "Listen, leave everything with me. 
We right. will um, sort it out for you. Some people um, are saying, now listen, I've got this attorney. Um, I'm getting married out of community. So I understand that this contract needs to be registered so that it's out of community, not in, in community. So you as the, when you get married or even now, if you've been married now for 10, 15 years, you must make sure that that marriage contract is registered. So you can phone a home office, you can phone attorneys to check for you at the deeds office, you can go to the deeds office just to see that your marriage is um, basically registered. Because it's happened so many times where people think they married out of community, but they married in community. Remember, these people buy um, other things and they should have obviously got the spouse to sign as well, but they didn't know. A lot of these clients, I don't think lied, um, TJ. They sincerely thought they married out of community. Yeah, yeah. I think that actually draws me to another point, Armand, where you actually think you're married, but you're not. <laughs> no, 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 no. So there's a difference between you getting your marriage certificate. Right. So if you get your marriage certificate, obviously you're married, you will get that. But your ANC contract, your anti national contract needs to be registered at the deeds office so that it becomes out of, out of community with or without the accrual. Yeah. Okay, all right. No, I totally understood. Okay. I'm okay. not going to hold you to the next answers that I'm going to ask of you, right? Sure. And you, you've been doing this for a while and, um, and I know that COVID is here. But when I'm buying a property care, at average, how long should I wait actually for the property to register, give or take? It's a cash buy. Okay, TJ, if you say it's a cash transfer, it should take four to six weeks. I would say average of four or five weeks. Right. Just to be safe, four to six weeks, because if there's a bond involved, you've got the bond attorney, you have to get all those necessary documentations and approvals and all of that. And that takes a bit of time. No, that's why we normally say normal property transfers should take two months. But when it's a cash transaction, you don't have the bond attorney. You've got one attorney there. And even though there's a bond to be canceled, that's also very quick. So I would say to be safe, I said between four and six weeks, five weeks. There we go. Okay, good. And if there is... If it is a bond on both sides, the moment that that um, uh, guarantee sits on your bank, on your on your desk, um, and it's 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 bond on both sides. I'm buying a bonded house, and that that property is yes. also bonded. So, in general, how long does that also uh, take? Blue sky well. So a no a normal transaction where you get a bond and there's a bond that needs to be cancelled, again, um, I would say between two and three months. So, but we normally, because we're quite fast and we do our thing and we specialize in conveyancing, we would register two months, basically eight weeks. Okay. And again, TJ, if there's a problem regarding anything, we will advise the um, buyer, we will advise the seller, we'll even get the state agent involved to say, listen, this is a problem. We need to sort it out. Let's get everybody involved. Let's see if we can sort this problem out quicker. Because your transaction that you said took um, nine months, that should have never happened. 100%. Right. As we come to a close, Armand, um, the question that I want to ask of you is that <clears throat> convincing it's a service that is being offered here, right? Um, and for a service to be uh, fulfilled, um, I'm as a client, there's certain things that I need to be providing for to enable you to do the work for me, right? And many a times we don't even see it that way. We just think that, ah, they're not doing their work there, but I'm going to pay them. <laughs> for the process to move smoother, Armand, what are the things that you should, what are the things that we can give advice to the people to say, hey, whenever you're buying a property, these are the basic stuff that you should have at hand for to, to enable Armand to work within his timelines of four weeks? Well, TJ, I salute you for that question because that's a fantastic question, okay? So if you're buying or selling your property, the things that you need to get ready basically is your FICA documents. Now, FICA documents is your ID document or your passport document, a proof of address, and even though your, 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 your tax number doesn't fall under FICA, your tax number, your bond 
account number. So the seller selling, obviously we need that bond account number to give it through to the bank to apply for the cancellation figures on that existing bond. The FICA documents, if you don't have the ID number or the passport number or the marriage certificate and all those type of things, you can't apply for rates figures. You can't apply for the things that you need to apply for. And then obviously you phone the client, but now maybe this client is overseas. You phone the agent and the agent says, listen, I never got the documentation. But remember, because of certain laws and everything that came into effect, you need to FICA your client. And to enable to FICA your client as an estate agent, as an attorney, you need to get the ID document. You need to see that the person that you're dealing with is the person that you're dealing with. So your, your ID document, your passport, your marriage certificate. So then we know this guy um, says he's married out of community. Yes, we've got his marriage certificate here. So he's definitely married out of community. Bond account number, all those type of things that you obviously um, need. The state agents these days, they are quite clued up and the people that we deal with, they ask for all these things in advance or even at mandate stage, or even when they sign the offer, they will request all these specific documents. Yeah. Does it make sense, DJ? It makes sense, hundred hundred percent. Thank, thanks a lot. You spoke of SARS, and yes. uh, and there's a specific document that you you guys get um, uh, from SARS, and if that document is not there, you can't obviously proceed with um, with the registration. Yes. I want to throw in a curveball. Um. SARS has been a, in existence for what? Uh, for too long. <laughs> too long? <laughs> no, it's just a joke. They, they do their work. People, there are people that, that are either not registered for tax, right? Because they working, they, they probably were working before SARS was in existence. Or yes. their, their bench, uh, their inning bracket back then was not. Um, yes. Uh, from a tax perspective, or, or could not be recouped. So there is a, a pocket of people within our societies who don't have tax numbers, who SARS don't know. It's a reality. I've bought properties like that before. Yes. And when it comes to tax number, they're like, uh, what is that? All right. And we, like, <laughs> with SARS, yes. they are not in existence. What happens in such kind of scenarios? And this is potentially, uh, I want to say elderly, maybe around about people that are within their 60s and plus. Correct me if I'm wrong here. You're right. So TJ, basically SARS uh, be became clever a couple of years ago and said, if you want to buy or sell a property, the transferring attorneys obviously must give us your tax number. So if your tax affairs are up to date, fantastic. The um, SARS payment to get the transfer due to receipt will be made and you'll get your um, transfer due to receipt. But if the buyer or the seller's tax is not up to date, that transfer won't proceed. Right. And what I've seen at my office lately is we'll receive an email from SARS saying, Mr. XYZ owes us 25,000 Rand please advise if there's enough proceeds to pay that 25,000 Rand out of that proceeds. <laughs> Otherwise, we are not going to give you the money. So TJ, they've become very clever with this. So if your tax affairs is not up to date, you must know that your transfer is not going to go through. Even if you're the buyer or the seller, they check both SARS numbers. And even on the agency or the agent side, this, the agent doing the transaction, they also check his or her ta tax number. But it has happened many, many cases where, like in your example, the people are quite elderly. They do not have a tax number. Yeah. Then, um, obviously, you would say um, tax number not applicable on your specific documentation. But that, that specific person that doesn't have a tax number must make contact with SARS and get a reference number. Right. And that reference number will prove that they're in the process of obtaining a tax number. So then the deal will proceed. So I'm not saying if your tax is not up to date. If your tax is not up to date and you don't make the necessary arrangements with SARS or you don't pay the money owing to them, the transfer won't go ahead. In your case, if there's no tax number, they're not going to stall the transaction. They just want proof that you are in the process of obtaining a tax number um, and SARS will give you that specific reference number and they will pick it up. 
They've got these systems in place that will pick it up. So it won't delay the transfer if you do not have a tax number. Again, you must just prove that you've applied for one. I, I didn't know that you're an agent for SAS. Uh, <laughs> all, all lawyers are now agents for SAS, which is good. They're doing a very honest work, um, PJ. They need, they need to collect, eh? 100%. I'm gonna jump on into our last segment and where I just ask a few random questions and um, you deal with a lot of investors, people that are buying properties all the time, selling them and things like that. And what is the one thing that you've been seeing that investors kind of like underestimate, but that is also key in, the, <clears throat> in their journey? You're saying a lot of things that the investors underestimate. So, now you think you are buying a bargain, PJ. You think, yes, I'm getting this property for 300,000 rand. What a bargain. The state agent told me if I paint this property and I do a bit of garden work, I'll be able to sell it for 600,000. I'll make a fancy big profit. Yeah. But then the problem comes in. There's rates and taxes and all those things, obviously, um, that needs to be paid. So right. then if... If, if, if you want to buy that specific property, being the buyer, you don't pay the rates and taxes. The seller obviously pays it. But remember, investors normally, they buy on auction. So if you buy a property on auction, you as that specific buyer, in some instances, are obviously liable for those rates and taxes payments to the local municipality. And then that rates and taxes can end up being for 500,000 rand. So in any type of circumstance, when you buy or sell property, you need to do your homework. So especially if you are in, 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 an investor. And let's say you are buying this uh, property that you're talking about for 300,000, and all of a sudden you see the rain came, and now the whole roof is leaking. And obviously there's a problem with the structure. So there's specific people that you can get out to obviously evaluate this property and see it's not going to cost you six, seven hundred K just to fix the property. So there's a lot of homework that you need to do before. And so a lot of investors has burned their fingers because if they bought it on auction, they need to pay these property taxes. And it's obviously more than what the property is worth. Or there's a lot of issues with this specific property and they didn't realize it's going to cost as much to fix. They thought we're just going to put some lipstick on paint and it's going to look beautiful. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of other stuff when it comes to that. They're putting lipstick on a pig there, it looks like it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Boom. So when you're a property investor, TJ, do your homework. 100%, 100%. Boom, you had it right. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Armand Neal and, uh, from Dykes Neal. And um, he was just, you had it. And I think there's quite a lot of things that we can learn from there. And uh, thanks, Armand, for having us and gracing us with your knowledge and experience. And um, uh, in the comments below, ladies and gentlemen, you should be able to get hold of Armand, uh, their website, email address, and contact details. If ever you are looking for anyone who wants to do convincing people who come out to you, I think I like that. I didn't know. I, I didn't know that uh, about that about you. <laughs> yeah, we drive out to all our clients, DJ. Um, it's just the extra service that we offer to ex expedite the process, man. Awesome stuff. Good having you around. Any closing comments from your side? No, fantastic. No, thank you for having me, DJ. It's awesome. And please, guys, if there's any questions or if you're in the process of buying or selling a property and you need some advice, please obviously contact me directly, contact the office, and we've got an email address on there, and get the right information and deal with the right convincing attorneys. Awesome stuff. That's Thank it. you. Cheers. God bless. Bye.